Chapter Nineteen of Sailing Alone Around the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Alan Chant. Sailing Alone Around the World by Joshua Slocum. Chapter Nineteen, consisting of In the Isle of Napoleon's Exile. Two lectures. A guest in the ghost room at Plantation House. An excursion to historic Longwood. Coffee in the husk and a goat to shell it. The spray's ill luck with animals. A prejudice against small dogs. A rat, the Boston spider, and the cannibal cricket. Ascension Island. It was about noon when the spray came to anchor off Jamestown, and all hands at once went ashore to pay respects to His Excellency the Governor of the island, Sir R. A. Sterndale. His Excellency, when I landed, remarked that it was not often nowadays that a circumnavigator came his way, and he cordially welcomed me, and arranged that I should tell about the voyage, first at Garden Hall to the people of Jamestown, and then at Plantation House, the Governor's residence, which is in the hills a mile or two back, to His Excellency and the officers of the garrison and their friends. Mr. Poole, our worthy consul, introduced me at the castle, and in the course of his remarks asserted that the sea serpent was a Yankee. Most royally was the crew of the spray entertained by the Governor, I remained at Plantation House a couple of days, and one of the rooms in the mansion called the West Room being haunted, the butler, by command of His Excellency, put me up in that, like a prince. Indeed, to make sure that no mistake had been made, His Excellency came later to see that I was in the right room, and to tell me about the ghosts he had seen or heard of. He had discovered all but one and wishing me pleasant dreams, he hoped I might have the honour of a visit from the unknown one of the West Room. For the rest of the chilly night I kept the candle burning, and often looked out from under the blankets, thinking that maybe I should meet the great Napoleon face to face. But I saw only furniture, and the horseshoe that was nailed over the door opposite my bed. St. Helena has been an island of tragedies, tragedies that have been lost sight of in wailing over the Corsican. On the second day of my visit, the governor took me by carriage road through the turns over the island. At one point of our journey, the road, in winding around spurs and ravines, formed a perfect W within the distance of a few rods. The roads, though tortuous and steep, were fairly good, and I was struck with the amount of labour it must have cost to build them. The air on the heights was cool and bracing. It is said that, since hanging for trivial offences went out of fashion, no one has died there, except from falling over the cliffs in old age, or from being crushed by stones rolling on them from the steep mountains. Witches at one time were persistent at St. Helena, as with us in America, in the days of Cotton Matha. At the present day crime is rare in the island. While I was there, Governor Sterndale, in token of the fact that not one criminal case had come to court within the year, was presented with a pair of white gloves by the officers of justice. Returning from the Governor's house to Jamestown, I drove with Mr. Clark, a countryman of mine, to Longwood, the home of Napoleon. Monsieur Morillo, French consular agent in charge, keeps the place respectable, and the buildings in good repair. His family at Longwood, consisting of wife and grown daughters, are natives of courtly and refined manners, and spend here days, months, and years of contentment, though they have never seen the world beyond the horizon of St. Helena. On the 20th of April the spray was again ready for sea, before going on board, I took luncheon with the governor and his family at the castle. Lady Sterndale had sent a large fruit-cake, 
early in the morning, from Plantation House to be taken along on the voyage. It was a great high-decker, and I ate sparingly of it, as I thought, but it did not keep as I had hoped it would. I ate the last of it, along with my first cup of coffee at Antigua West Indies, which, after all, was quite a record. The one my own sister made me at the little island in the Bay of Fundy, at the first of the voyage, kept about the same length of time, namely forty-two days. After luncheon a royal mail was made up for ascension, the island next on my way. Then Mr. Poole and his daughter paid the spray a farewell visit, bringing me a basket of fruit. It was late in the evening before the anchor was up, and I bore off for the west, loath to leave my new friends. But fresh winds filled the sloop sails once more, and I watched the beacon light at Plantation House, the governor's parting signal for the spray, till the island faded in the darkness astern, and became one with the night, and by midnight the light itself had disappeared below the horizon. When morning came there was no land in sight, but the day went on the same as days before, save for one small incident. Governor Sterndale had given me a bag of coffee in the husk, and Clark, the American, in an evil moment, had put a goat on board to butt the sack and hustle the coffee beans out of the pods. He urged that the animal, besides being useful, would be as companionable as a dog. I soon found that my sailing companion, this sort of dog with horns, had to be tied up entirely. The mistake I made was that I did not chain him to the mast instead of tying him with grass ropes less securely, and this I learned to my cost. Except for the first day, before the beast got his sea-legs on, I had no peace of mind. After that, actuated by a spirit born maybe of his pasturage, this incarnation of evil threatened to devour everything from flying jib to stern davits. He was the worst pirate I met on the whole voyage. He began depredations by eating my chart of the West Indies in the cabin one day while I was about my work forward, thinking that the critter was securely tied on deck by the pumps. Alas, there was not a rope in the sloop proof against that goat's awful teeth. It was clear from the very first that I was having no luck with animals on board. There was the tree-crab from the Keeling Islands. No sooner had it got a claw through its prison-box than my sea-jacket hanging within reach was torn to ribbons. Encouraged by this success, it smashed the box open and escaped into my cabin, tearing up things generally and finally threatening my life in the dark. I had hoped to bring the creature home alive, but this did not prove feasible. Now the goat devoured my straw hat, and so when I arrived in port I had nothing to wear ashore on my head. This last unkind stroke decided his fate. On the 27th of April the spray arrived at Ascension, which was garrisoned by a man-of-war crew, and the boatswain of the island came on board. As he stepped out of his boat, the mutinous goat climbed into it, and defied boatswain and crew. I hired them to land the wretch at once, which they were only too willing to do, and there he fell into the hands of a most excellent Scotchman, with the chances that he would never get away. I was destined to sail once more into the depths of solitude, but these experiences had no bad effect upon me. On the contrary, a spirit of charity and even benevolence grew stronger in my nature through the meditation of these supreme hours on the sea. In the loneliness of the dreary country about Cape Horn, I found myself in no mood to make one life less in the world, except in self-defence. And, as I sailed, this trait of the hermit character grew, till the mention of killing food animals was revolting to me. However well I may have enjoyed a chicken stew afterwards at Samoa, a new self rebelled at the thought suggested there of carrying chickens to be slain for my table on the voyage. And Mrs. Stevenson, hearing my protest, agreed with me that to kill the companions of my voyage and eat them would be indeed next to murder and cannibalism. 
As to pet animals, there was no room for a noble large dog on the spray on so long a voyage, and a small cur was for many years associated in my mind with hydrophobia. I witnessed once the death of a sterling young German from that dreadful disease, and about the same time heard of the death, also by hydrophobia, of the young gentleman who had just written a line of insurance in his company's books for me. I have seen the whole crew of a ship scamper up the rigging to avoid a dog racing about the decks in a fit. It would never do, I thought, for the crew of the spray to take a canine risk. And with these just prejudices indelibly stamped on my mind, I have, I am afraid, answered impatiently too often the query, Why didn't you have a dog? with, I and the dog wouldn't have been very long in the same boat in any sense. A cat would have been a harmless animal, I dare say, but there was nothing for Puss to do on board, and she is an unsociable animal at best. True, a rat got into my vessel at the Keeling Cocos Islands, and another at Rodriguez, along with a centipede stowed away in the hold. But one of them I drove out of the ship, and the other I caught. This is how it was. For the first one, with infinite pains, I made a trap, looking to its capture and destruction. But the wily rodent, not to be deluded, took the hint, and got ashore the day the thing was completed. It is, according to tradition, a most reassuring sign to find rats coming to a ship. And I had a mind to abide the knowing one of Rodriguez. But a breach of discipline decided the matter against him. While I slept one night, my ship sailing on, he undertook to walk over me, beginning at the crown of my head, concerning which I am always sensitive. I slept lightly. Before his impertinence had got him even to my nose, I cried, Rat! had him by the tail, and threw him out of the companionway into the sea. As for the centipede, I was not aware of its presence, till the wretched insect, all feet and venom, beginning, like the rat at my head, wakened me by a sharp bite on the scalp. This also was more than I could tolerate. After a few applications of kerosene, the poisonous bite, painful at first, gave no further inconvenience. From this on, for a time, no living thing disturbed my solitude. No insect even was present in my vessel, except the spider and his wife from Boston, now with a family of young spiders. Nothing, I say, till sailing down the last stretch of the Indian Ocean, where mosquitoes came by hundreds from rainwater poured out of the heavens. Simply a barrel of rainwater stood on deck five days, I think, in the sun. Then music began. I knew the sound at once. It was the same as heard from Alaska to New Orleans. Again at Cape Town, while dining out one day, I was taken with the sound of a cricket. And Mr. Branscombe, my host, volunteered to capture a pair of them for me. They were sent on board next day in a box labelled Pluto and Scamp. Stowing them away in the binnacle in their own snug box, I left them there without food till I got to sea a few days. I had never heard of a cricket eating anything. It seems that Pluto was a cannibal, for only the wings of poor Scamp were visible when I opened the lid, and they lay broken on the floor of the prison box. Even with Pluto it had gone hard, for he lay on his back stark and stiff, never to chirrup again. Ascension Island where the goat was marooned, is called the Stone Frigate R.N., and is rated tender to the South African squadron. It lies in 7 degrees 55 minutes south latitude, and 14 degrees 25 minutes west longitude, being in the very heart of the southeast trade winds, and about 840 miles from the coast of Liberia. It is a mass of volcanic matter, thrown up from the bed of the ocean to the height of 2,818 feet at the highest point above sea level. It is a strategic point, and belonged to Great Britain before it got cold. 
In the limited but rich soil at the top of the island, among the clouds, vegetation has taken root, and a little scientific farming is carried on under the supervision of a gentleman from Canada. Also a few cattle and sheep are pastured there for the garrison mess. Water storage is made on a large scale. In a word, this heap of cinders and lava rock is stored and fortified and would stand a siege. Very soon after the spray arrived, I received a note from Captain Blacksland, the commander of the island, conveying his thanks for the royal mail brought from St. Helena, and inviting me to luncheon with him and his wife and sisters at headquarters not far away. It is hardly necessary to say that I availed myself of the captain's hospitality at once. A carriage was waiting up the jetty when I landed, and a sailor with a broad grin led the horse carefully up the hill to the captain's house, as if I were a lord of the admiralty, and a governor besides. And he led it as carefully down again when I returned. On the following day I visited the summit among the clouds, the same team being provided, and the same old sailor leading the horse. There was probably not a man on the island at that moment better able to walk than I. The sailor knew that. I finally suggested that we change places. Let me take the bridle, I said, and keep the horse from bolting. Great stone frigate! he exclaimed as he burst into a laugh. This here horse wouldn't bolt no faster than a turtle. If I didn't tow him hard, we'd never get into port. I walked most of the way over the steep grades, whereupon my guide, every inch a sailor, became my friend. Arriving at the summit of the island, I met Mr. Shank, the farmer from Canada, and his sister, living very cosily in a house among the rocks, as snug as cronies and as safe. He showed me over the farm, taking me through a tunnel which led from one field to the other, divided by an inaccessible spur of mountain. Mr. Shank said that he had lost many cows and bullocks, as well as sheep, from breakneck over the steep cliffs and precipices. One cow, he said, would sometimes hook another right over a precipice to destruction, and go on feeding unconcernedly. It seemed that the animals on the island farm, like mankind in the wide world, found it all too small. On the 26th of April, while I was ashore, rollers came in which rendered launching a boat impossible. However, the sloop being securely moored to a buoy in deep water outside of all breakers, she was safe, while I, in the best of quarters, listened to well-told stories among the officers of the stone frigate. On the evening of the twenty-ninth, the sea having gone down, I went on board and made preparations to start again on my voyage early next day, the boatswain of the island and his crew giving me a hearty handshake as I embarked at the jetty. For reasons of scientific interest, I invited in mid-ocean the most thorough investigation concerning the crew list of the spray. Very few had challenged it, and perhaps few ever will do so henceforth. But for the benefit of the few that may, I wished to clench beyond doubt the fact that it was not at all necessary in the expedition of a sloop around the world to have more than one man for the crew, all told, and that the spray sailed with only one person on board and so by appointment left Tenant Eagles, the executive officer, in the morning just as I was ready to sail, fumigated the sloop, rendering it impossible for a person to live concealed below, and proving that only one person was on board when she arrived. A certificate to this effect, besides the official documents from many consulates, health offices and custom houses, will seem to many superfluous. But this story of the voyage may find its way into hands unfamiliar with the business of these offices, and of their ways of seeing that a vessel's papers, and above all her bills of health, are in order. The lieutenant's certificate being made out, the spray nothing loath, now filled away clear of the sea-beaten rocks and the trade winds, comfortably cool and bracing, sent her flying along on her course. 
On May 8, 1898, she crossed the track homeward bound that she had made on October 2, 1895, on the voyage out. She passed Fernando de Narona at night, going some miles south of it, and so I did not see the island. I felt a contentment in knowing that the spray had encircled the globe, and even as an adventure alone I was in no way discouraged as to its utility, and said to myself, Let what will happen, the voyage is now on record. A period was made. End of chapter 19 Read by Alan Chant in Tunbridge, Kent, England www.sevenoaksprep.kent.sch.uk